We're going to start with a blitz from social media DMs. I fished out some good questions there in the counts I hadn't checked for 700 years. And then we're going to get to slower questions from the community as we normally do. Who is worse, Putin or Lukashenko? Holy mackerel. I mean, Lukashenko is a bigger sicko, so it would be more difficult to share a house with him than with Putin. So if you were going to be stuck with one of them for the rest of your life on a tropical island, I'd strongly recommend Putin. Um, but Putin would have done much more damage historically by the end of his life than Lukashenko, in part because Lukashenko didn't have the chance. He was running a much smaller country, a country without an imperialist syndrome. Lukashenko is a real sicko with severe narcissistic personality disorder, but he is highly talented. So imagine a comparison with Trump. Trump is eye-wateringly weak and incompetent behind closed doors, even though in certain particular dimensions he is a communicator of genius in the public eye. But when you close the door, politically Trump is almost a non-actor. He is incapable of um, developing any kind of sustained project, mission, um, aspiration that needs to be realized with discipline and imagination. And they were staggered by Trump's incompetence in the Kremlin. But um, Lukashenko is like a Trump who is also competent behind closed doors. So Lukashenko is without doubt one of the most talented world leaders. And in part, he is still in power because of his extraordinary talent. I mean, there's no way Trump would have lasted in Lukashenko's position. Um, so Lukashenko is a political genius, without doubt, but a very toxic one. Personally, I wouldn't recommend you uh, sharing time with him on an island. Can the war spread? Yes. The logic of the war is to spread, no matter how weak the Russian army is, because Putin is on a wide pattern of escalation that goes beyond Ukraine. But that doesn't mean that it will spread. It just means that that's the default tendency. And whether we go there depends on many factors that come in between. How is nuclear risk today? Nuclear risk is quite a bit lower today than it was when we made nuclear videos earlier on on the main channel. But... I mean, how do I talk about this without freaking you out? Um, we are moving toward a nuclear crisis as far as, again, the default of the trajectory goes. That's where we're going unless factors intervene. So it's not that things need to happen to move us to a nuclear crisis. That's where we're going. Um, and things can intervene that could mitigate it, um, stop it um, early on or at the last minute and so on. Um, one of the factors here is that if the Putin regime continues to develop further tears, that could be one of the things that helps us avert a crisis with significant nuclear escalation and significant nuclear threats from the Kremlin. So the risk is low now, but the default trajectory is not, is not good. And short of quite a few plausible things that could intervene, intervening, we're going to be talking about a problem of nuclear escalation in months to come. If you were Putin with Putin's aims, but you were better informed, what would you do instead of invading Ukraine? I'd do a hybrid invasion of one of the Baltic states without killing anybody and then see what happens. That would be my strategy and it's something that's still absolutely within Putin's book. It's, it's a situation that's um, um, available to him as a scenario. Is there a crisis of the public intellectual? Yes, of course. 
a huge crisis. What's the crisis? Well, short of an, an analysis, let's look at the terminus. The terminus is that, let's say something wrong and then say something slightly more correct. The terminus is that public intellectuals today are struggling to reveal and illuminate cultural deformations and instead of themselves being victimized by these cultural deformations. So let's say something that's a bit truer than this falsehood, that's a helpful falsehood that we've just put on the table. When public intellectuals successfully reveal cultural deformations in the process of revealing these cultural deformations, they themselves succumb to other and equally pathetic cultural deformations, equally pathetic for intellectuals meant to be self-aware. So there are quite certainly is a crisis of the public intellectual and we need to talk about it. Another factor that's involved here is that we're living in a culture in which authority is increasingly conflated with identity. We have to talk about that more in the future. If Putin thinks Ukraine doesn't exist, does he see his invasion as a civil war? Yes, with a qualification. So for him, what happened circa 2014 is a civil war within Ukraine that Russia was sponsoring for Putin. For Putin now, that Ukraine is sort of unified against Russia, it now represents a party, all of Ukraine represents a party in a civil war. So Ukraine is a civil war internal, the Ukraine war is a civil war internal to Russia, but there is a very big but. It's a foreign-sponsored civil war as far as Putin is concerned. So Ukrainians are, and I'm exaggerating, but I'm emitting Putin's view for you, not my view, my own view, obviously. Um, Ukrainians are Russians who have completely lost their stuff, lost the plot completely, and got taken over by malign um, American interests and this needs to be rectified um, so it's a civil war but it's a foreign sponsored civil war moreover putin's paranoid position tends to be that there aren't foreign wars civil wars that aren't foreign sponsored how significant is the latest ukrainian advance it's enormously significant for ukraine not just for the obvious reasons but for reasons of mobilizing the west and averting um, decay in Western commitment and, as it were, papering over the cracks of the divide between Eastern Europe and Western Europe about the Ukraine war divide that's still there in Israel. Now, what's very important in my view, this is always my suggestion, is that you've got to have a strategy about the Ukraine war, which roughly should be let's get Ukraine to win as significantly as possible and as quickly as possible. And it's important to stick to that strategy, no matter what the reality on the ground looks like, because that can change with the uncertainty of war. And so what's happened in the last few days is more and more people have come out and said, OK, OK, maybe it is a good idea to back Ukraine hard all the way. And I suggest that that should have been the position even when the dynamics looked more stalematey, as it were. Now, what's the significance from the Russian side? It's a blow for Putin, but Putin will still think that he can win. And by win, I don't just mean win the war in Ukraine. I mean win the war against the West, uh, weaken or dismantle NATO, and reintegrate Russia on very different terms with Western countries over the next decade. Is Putin completely... Um, on another planet with this plan. Um, he's badly losing with it, but he's not on another planet. I think his odds of realizing it are not, you know, they're not zero, they're not even 5%, they're more than that. Do you personally prefer to make content for the main channel or for the chat channel? And that's in connection with our conversation 
yesterday um, about the fact that I need to make content in a different way on the main channel if this community is to grow because YouTube needs your content to be interesting to people who are half interested in it to then show your content to people who are genuinely deeply interested in it. And that means that what we do here on this channel is, as it were, useless as far as growing the community goes. That's why this channel is all about the community, as it were, as it is. And then the main channel can feed people into the community. Um, and the question is, what do I prefer of the two? I prefer this. I prefer the chat channel by far for two reasons. There's a banal reason and a serious reason. The banal reason is that I'm talking to you now and it's going to take me probably about 15 seconds per minute of chatting with you to work this video up and upload it. In other words, it's just going to have the time stamps and the questions added to it and that's it. It just goes up. So it basically takes virtually no effort on top of just chatting with you. 15 seconds per minute of conversation. On the main channel, and I got a little bit of one-off informal help with the last couple of videos. Um, it took about two and a half hours per minute of content, um, if not three. So you can see the vast difference. We're talking about 15 seconds per minute versus two and a half hours per minute. So this is obviously much more conducive um, and sustainable as far as my health goes and I prefer it but there's a deeper reason I prefer it and that's that um, as concentrated as the videos are on the main channel as pregnant as they are and they are quite pregnant often I'm saying something that could be said in four sentences in one sentence and there's a palpable sense of implicature that takes you in different directions and that's rich and could even justify with the better videos on the main channel watching them more than once but I think that it's easier for somebody else to match the quality of the videos on the main channel and harder for them to match the quality of the better discussions that I have with you on the chat channel um, often the discussions are not great if my health is not so good and I'm fuzzy. If I'm less fuzzy and struggling a bit less with physical symptoms and I can concentrate more on what we're talking about, then that is harder for people to match. Um, so therefore, I would say in terms of objective quality, um, it's a rarer product that we've got on this chat channel than what we've got on the main channel. Um, because you could do the research, um, you can edit videos better than I, I edit them, you can make better sound for them than, than, than I do, um, you know, I mean, put it this way, um, Johnny Harris in 30 seconds of a video in terms of the fluency, the um, uh, persuasiveness of the content um, does more than I do in 20 minutes. But if you got just a mobile phone stuck on Johnny's face and you made him talk about his topic and then made me talk about my topics, there'd be no comparison in sophistication, in depth of insight and so on. So that's why I think um, the chat channel is actually a uh, rarer product because if you took the creators on other channels who talk about I don't know geopolitics or political ideas ideology democracy authoritarianism um, and just shove the camera in their face the gap between what they've come up with and what I've come up with will be much much bigger than the gap between what they would do and I would do if we spent a week or two weeks making a video. So for that reason, I also prefer the chat channel, but that's not the view of the YouTube algorithm. Um, the YouTube algorithm does not love the chat channel. Um, but, you know, luckily, uh, we, we, we can sort of defy it and just carry on. And um, I will carry on because I think this conversation is absolutely central to developing 
a, a relationship of trust between us. Sam asks, engaging with stories like yours has allowed me to reflect on the uncertainty of the future ahead of us. It's hard not to get jaded or feel helpless. If you have the time, do you have any suggestions on coping with this anxiety? Look, Sam, my views are quite generic here. First of all, buffers are important. So don't let stuff come in when it's too much, when it's not the right time. Um, so filter how the challenging bits of the world come into you, come into your body. You know, don't consume it like junk food. Have meal times. Um, have some idea of how this stuff is coming in. It shouldn't just be pouring in from all directions as soon as you wake up on four different devices. Second, action and purpose really matters. Um, if you're concerned about something out there in the world, do something. It doesn't have to be directly in connection with whatever it is that worries your challenges. It could be very indirect. You could be worried about national politics, but you could do something um, that is about community engagement in your local area, you know. So some kind of purposive action uh, could make a difference. The action could even just be self-education. You could start reading Thucydides and Machiavelli, you know. So I think action is also really important. And then something else that's really important is that when we're talking about issues like being worried about your democracy, it's never black and white. It's always a matter of degree. You know, just like it is true with the climate crisis, every point one of a degree matters, you know? So there's no point ever to give up. So it's exactly the same with something like the challenge of democratic decline. Um, every inch matters and it's worth fighting it and just because you've slid down three or four inches is not in any way a reason to stop uh, being motivated to avoid sli slid sliding down a further inch you know so it's that matter of degree every little step backward and forward matters so don't think of this stuff as something you have or something you don't have a functional society the functional democracy think of it as some kind of goal that you are moving toward or moving away from and that journey is full of challenges and surprises. Ivan asks, why do people find political institutions opaque? Is it over complexity? Is it dysfunctionality? And how damaging is it when bureaucracies become ideological? There are different ways in which people lose trust. You can lose trust by feeling that your government is incompetent. You can lose trust by feeling that your government is against you. You can feel trust by lose trust by feeling that whatever your government does, you can't do anything about to inflect the direction of travel. But you can also feel a kind of opacity about your government, which may, might make you want to give up or believe in conspiracy theories. When you look at your government, and it isn't even clear how it works. You're looking at a game, the rules to which no longer make sense. It's kind of like an ill-assorted combination of cricket, rugby, and table tennis. This just doesn't make any sense. Um, one of the central features of this problem is that institutions and the language in which they justify themselves to themselves and to you, the citizen, now seem alien to people. The language in which political institutions, legal institutions, public health institutions justify themselves to you has lost the kind of friction that it had with how you think about your values, your life, your project. That friction is much diminished now. It's um, quite difficult for these institutions to connect their discourse with the discourse of a human being going about their life and trying to lead a life that makes sense 
And so that's the problem that I often label as private sentiment and public discourse drifting too far apart from one another. And that creates the possibility for exploitative populism to come in, which says, well, let's talk about public institutions as though they were just a matter of Ricky sitting at the dinner table and planning what he's going to do next year. So that's reducing democratic discourse, public discourse in a democracy with complex institutions to table talk. There's so much to say, but that's just one little grain worth throwing out onto the table. How damaging is it when bureaucracies become ideological? Yes, the last thing you want is for your political project to be absorbed by a bureaucracy such that it sides with yours, such that it sides with your project and against the projects of your political opponents. Um, this is happening in Western societies and it's a catastrophe, partly because that just doesn't work, partly because it's incompatible with feeling that all citizens are included and partly because it's going to lead to a backlash. So if I have a very strong ethical commitment on some issue in society and I'm, let us say, an academic, the last thing I want is, I want to persuade my colleagues of my view, possibly, but the last thing I want is the bureaucracy of my university taking my position. Um, that would be, in the long run, counterproductive in just about every way. Comment of the day from Anita. Vlad Vexler is a propaganda peddler in the service of the Anglo-Zionist globalists rabid with frustration at not having been able to topple Putin and re-enter Russia. <laughs> oh my god, this is good. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, what can I say? That's me. Jan asks, Vlad, what's your view on Brexit? I mean, for goodness sake. Let's Let's say something about Brexit um, that is sufficiently general to apply to everybody, wherever they are. Um, there are some illusions that you can find on the Brexiteer side and on the Remainer side. So let's take the Brexiteer illusions first and name maybe a couple of them. The first illusion is a kind of magical thinking. In other words, um, most supporters of Brexit, to a spectacular degree, had a magical view of the consequences of the policy they were supporting. It's not that they thought that we're going to have Brexit and then X and Y will be the results of Brexit and X and Y will be achieved by, by these particular means and this is what will cause what and this is the outcome we're going to have. There's an absence of a cause and effect psychology there, just like there is with Trump's base. There is an absence of a cause and effect psychology there. Trump's base doesn't know exactly what Trump could do for them or how or by what mechanisms. So that's one illusion on the Brexit side. Another illusion on the Brexit side is a kind of a before and after illusion. That's to say that we can do quite a bit to um, mess around with our political system and quite a bit to relate to our opponents as though they were part of true Britain. Because once we get Brexit, then we're all going to come together. And what happened to achieve Brexit and the toxicity and divisiveness of it is not going to be any longer part of our society. And that's this sort of before and after psychology that you see in a much more dense and rich way, for instance, with extremist terrorism, whereby there is the thought, well, we can create a bloodbath today, but tomorrow we're going to start afresh and we're going to have a magical turning of the page such that the ugliness of how we got to our destination is not going to, as it were, permeate into our experience of that destination uh, in any way at all, such that it, it just doesn't matter how ugly the route is. Um, it only matters that we get to the destination, which will then immunize us from being ethically tainted by the route we used to get there. 
I mean, on the Remain side, one illusion is teleology, obviously. The idea that Brexit is on the wrong side of history is the wrong idea, of course, because there is no side of history on which one can be wrong or right. Um, so there's this idea of progress that it feels Brexit has violated. Um, and so that's a real problem. I think there is also the feeling among some uh, Remainers that Brexit is inauthentic. It's just an expression of malign foreign interference um, that's manipulated the public discourse. That's not false, but it's an overwhelming exaggeration the way, the way that idea is understood by most people. And then the third and I think most significant illusion on the Remainer side is the idea that um, all you've got to say to the Brexit is that they're, they're irrational. And the problem with that is that that's itself a kind of magical thinking that says that I can just go like this and, as it were, eject from the table of politics people I don't want anything to do with, people I don't want to negotiate with as fellow citizens. The problem is you can't do that. And so when you are quote-unquote ejecting them, you're not ejecting them, you're just going like that. And then they're still sitting at the table of politics. They're doing politics while you're pretending that you've ejected them and it's you who's going to be left behind. Um, so there are deep, deep pathologies on the Remain side and any self-aware Remain that has got to realize that the overwhelming... Uh, preponderance of Remain discourse is um, profoundly destructive and delusional. Um, and I say that as somebody who doesn't even feel they live in, in Britain in the first instance, I, I feel I live in Europe. And I feel my neighboring cities aren't just British cities, they're European cities. And indeed, perhaps even some cities on the um, east coast of the United States. So I am as European as it gets. And obviously, if you, know, you put me in a booth and ask me to vote remain or brexit i'm going to vote remain every single time but that doesn't affect my um judgment of the landscape which i've just shared with you al asks why did gorbachev stay in russia and didn't leave um so Gorbachev's family has been in Germany for quite a long time and he is adored in Germany and adored in much of the West and despised in Russia. So why did he live alone um, in an extraordinarily toxic environment that calls him a traitor for rising through the ranks of um, this extraordinary structure, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and as a solitary agent, without any allies, getting to the very top, and as soon as he got to the top, beginning to break the system, beginning to dismantle the system. That's one of the most extraordinary things in modern political history, what Gorbachev went about doing. Um, so how come he's hated for that? How can a person be in, in, in a country that, that hates him for this? Um, because he never stopped being a leader, he never stopped being a politician. He's responsible for his country. He didn't leave out of a sense of responsibility and also out of a sense of a certain kind of self-love and a frustrated self-love. Um, he feels he is the president of that country ethically, symbolically, and he is not the sort of leader that leaves his people just because they hate him. He is mature enough to say, I'm going to take responsibility for the fact that it'll be a long time for history to absorb my um, contribution and my mistakes. Um, so Gorbachev stayed, despite his agonizing aloneness, out of a sense of responsibility. Vlad, it appears that Putin has truly gone mad. Do you feel mobilization will eventually occur? And if so, how would the Gosduma and Putin and various organizations within stifle the demonstrations in the streets? 
there won't be many demonstrations in the streets if there is mobilization. Or has Putin now essentially eradicated all dissent in preparation for this possible scenario? Um, Putin is not ready to properly declare war on Ukraine as far as what he wants the local population to be, the Russian population to be cognizant of. He doesn't want them to think that it's a war. And he is not ready to do mobilization. Um, mobilization done too formally and pushed too hard would risk introducing a further tear into the Putin regime that could obliterate it. I think it's unlikely that it would obliterate it, but there is that risk and Putin is aware of that risk. And then there is a further risk that it won't work because it won't make a significant difference to the outcome of the military action on Ukrainian territory. And more, moreover, um, there will be such imaginative and endemic evasion by the Russian population that too will undermine the effort. So he is open to going further with this, but at the moment his position is that the gains are uncertain and the dangers are significant. Just to finish, I want to share with you an answer just a few hours ago that Alexei Venediktov gave to a question from an audience about what Putin's um, ideal for Russia is like. Because um, I thought his answer was brilliant. Um, just to remind you, Venediktov is um, the editor-in-chief of Echo Moscow that has now been shut. He has been declared a foreign agent. Um, but he has had meetings with Putin over many, many years, um, and he has access, I think it's better to say this in the past tense, he had access to the regime that was perhaps greater than anybody else's in the journalistic pot in uh, Russia. So that's what, here's what Venediktov says about Putin's ideal Какова, вот Григорий спрашивает, какова идеальная Россия, к которой стремится Путин в его представлении? Это Советский Союз времен Брежнева, времен Сталина Я или понимаю. нечто совсем иное? Смотрите, как зовут нашего зрителя? А, Григорий. Григорий, смотрите, это мое представление о том, как представляет Путин. Да? Это империя. Это не Советский Союз. Это империя, ну, может быть, Александра Третьего. Мифологическая империя, мифологического Александра Третьего, да? То есть то, что в представлении, да? And let's play a bit more because they come to Gorbachev. And what we were saying on the main channel about Gorbachev is that he had this extraordinary capacity to evolve, that he wasn't either a political ideologue or some kind of philosophical theoretician. And when it came to understanding the development for the country, he just wanted to take the next few steps and see. And so his political project was always evolving in its shape. And his political ethics were always evolving in its shape. And these two men, who both knew Gorbachev deeply well and spent hours upon hours with him over years and years and years, um, say this very, very beautifully um, yesterday in, the, in their chat. So have a look. Когда... Михаил Сергеевич умер. Ты знаешь, я, э, я подумал, что это один был из редчайших э, людей, который корректировал постоянно образ страны, который у него получается. Вот я как раз хотел, Сереж, ты попал просто, мы не сговаривались. Помните, я вам говорил про эту книгу да. «Политбюро ЦК КПСС»? Это выдержки с э, закрытых заседаний не только Политбюро, но и совещаний. Но если мы возьмем, например, как менялась позиция Горбачева от 85 -го к 88 -му году по Афганистану, по одной теме, угу. да, по одной теме. И мы видим, что у человека менялось представление и о стране, и о демократии, и, кстати, о гласности, да, и о людях. So, um, lots of love. I hope you've had a good weekend and talk very, very soon.